welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. As we continue and, in fact, conclude our discussion of the market economy from 1820 to 1860 or so, we're going to turn in this final lecture to a discussion of African American life and culture under the institution of slavery. When we left off talking about slavery in a previous lecture, I mentioned that the North was on its way to abolishing slavery while the institution was growing and strengthening in the South. That growth and strengthening of slavery may be due more to the introduction of the cotton gin and the prominence of what comes to be known as King Cotton than any other factor. You may have heard of Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin. He was a northern school teacher who moved south looking for employment and in 1793 perfected the cotton gin, a device that radically changed the economy of the South and of the nation. Up to that point, Southern planters had had some success growing long staple cotton, which grew only in the coastal areas. Now, short staple cotton grew across virtually the entire South, but was difficult to harvest because it had lots of sticky seeds that made it hard to clean. The cotton gin was a device that pulled the seeds out of short staple cotton and made it very efficient to grow as a crop. Almost immediately, planters across the South switched from growing other crops to growing short staple cotton. And the boom in cotton led many farmers to migrate from the East to the West. The West including parts of Georgia, Alabama, and later Louisiana and Texas. In 1790, the South produced some 3,000 bales of cotton. In 1820, it produced over 300,000 bales. And you get a sense just from this chart, the impact this has on slavery and the extension of slavery between 1790 and here by the eve of the Civil War in 1860. The boom in cotton not only increased the wealth of the South and led to the nickname King Cotton, but also revitalized the institution of slavery and led to the period when it reaches its most harsh and debilitating peak. So what was life like for the slaves living on these farms and plantations? Well, obviously, the work was hard. The slaves typically worked 14-hour days and sometimes 18-hour days were not that uncommon. Each slave was expected to pick 130 to 150 pounds of cotton every day. Slaves working on sugar plantations worked constantly to care for the crop, digging ditches, weeding, and fertilizing in snake-infested fields. At harvest time, they had to cut, strip, and haul huge loads of the cane. And sugar cane, you might know, is very tough and the leaves can cut the skin like razor blades. Slaves working in rice fields had perhaps the toughest conditions, forced to stand all day in water, sometimes up to their knees. Slave homes were typically crude log cabins, usually with a dirt floor. Cracks in the walls let in heat, cold, and mosquitoes. Their diet was repetitive and left many malnourished. They lived mostly on salt pork or bacon and cornbread, every now and then with molasses if they were lucky. They didn't get many vegetables. And female slaves had things particularly rough because they did much of the same work as men working in the fields and yet were also expected to care for the home, cook, sew, and care for children after hours. Rules against pregnant slaves working in the fields were often ignored and as I've mentioned previously, they were also often subjected to rape and abuse from white masters. And then there was the punishment. Punishment against slaves could be incredibly cruel. Masters did not hesitate to use the whip to keep their slaves in line. And other forms of punishment were not uncommon. Slaves might be put in stockades, chains, or muzzles. They might be burned, branded, salt put in the wounds, or even castrated. I want to share with you a few clippings from newspapers that just drive home uh, in print and in terms of a real historical source some of the factors that we've talked about. 
So the idea that slaves were property might be hard for those of us in the modern era to get our minds around. But when you look at newspapers of this era, you see frequent references to things that remind us that they were regarded as property. Here we have in this headline, Valuable Slave Killed. 35 Negroes and Other Property for Sale. Sale of Valuable Negroes and so on. And then in this article, which you may want to pause the lecture and read this uh, news clipping a little bit, it's about a family and the, the uh, house burns down. The women were exceedingly valuable. So these are human beings killed, but the only uh, response is that they were exceedingly valuable. And then here in reference to a, a slave uprising or rebellion, it's described as a stampede. Now we're going to talk in just a moment and in some future lectures about the prospect of slaves running away. And this also becomes very common, and you see references to it in newspapers of the day uh, very frequently. So we have uh, reports in what we would call the classified ads in the newspapers of runaway slaves. And here, $20 reward, $10 reward for anyone uh, who offers assistance in tracking down these runaway slaves. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this process and the prominence of slaves running away in just a moment. There are also some very interesting stories and cases from the newspapers, and I'm not going to read all of these in, in full here in this lesson, but again, I, I invite you to pause the lecture and you can look at the screen and go through them more thoroughly on your own time. But we have a case here, a breakdown on the Underground Railroad describing uh, a runaway. And if you read the full article, you see there are two slaves running away, and one of them actually hides underneath a mattress in a box underneath the other slave. Um, this is a reference to a famous case, that of Henry Box Brown, who actually shipped himself to freedom uh, in a box. And then in this case here, we have a case of a slave who just couldn't take the abuse anymore and actually lashed out uh, and attacked his master. And we're going to be talking more about these kinds of acts of resistance in just a moment. And finally, we see instances that, uh, depending on your vantage point, may indicate more of a happy ending for some of the slaves. Uh, not so much this story, although this is a very interesting case of a family that was poisoned and suspicion rested upon the slaves. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But then in these other two stories, um, Ben Hughes, who was charged with killing one of his Negroes, is convicted of manslaughter and winds up in prison for eight years. And this is a case in which slaves were freed um, by their master, manumitted all of his slaves, 200 in number. So we're going to be talking about examples like this and others um, going forward. So it's important to remember that even within the institution of slavery, slaves were able to maintain uh, and develop some of their own unique culture and determine as much as they could their own fate um, within the institution. For instance, they would sing songs, both in the fields and in their homes at night. Oftentimes, the songs carried much deeper meanings than the masters knew or thought. The masters heard them singing songs and assumed the slaves were happy, but they could have very different meanings. Many of them were just the opposite of being happy. They conveyed deep sorrow, but gave the slaves some outlet for their unhappiness. Others contained veiled insults against the master and about whites, and allowed the slaves some satisfaction in insulting the master without being punished. And others contained coded messages that might talk about ways to uh, achieve their freedom, to sing steal away to Jesus meant that there was a religious meeting that night, or I am bound for the land of Canaan may have had many meetings. meanings, could have meant freedom in the north or spiritual freedom or instructions to run away. They also told stories, which was a form of education. Slaves typically were denied a traditional kind of school book 
style education, but in telling stories, they could pass on their traditions. And in other instances, the stories as well contained kind of coded messages. One of the, the famous stories of Br'er Rabbit um, included messages of lowly creatures turning the tables on uh, stronger creatures and achieving mastery over them or achieving their freedom. Br'er Rabbit, who tells his captors, please, please don't throw me in the briar patch. And the captors think that's the worst punishment they can do, so they throw the rabbit in the briar patch, and of course, that allows him his freedom. There were other forms of resistance and rebellion as well. I talked in previous lectures about things like breaking tools, working slowly, feigning ignorance, and so on. So let's focus on some other new ideas. Uh, more and more slaves took to running away during this time. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, oftentimes they would run away only temporarily. They wanted to visit family or friends on another plantation or just thought they needed a break. Of course, upon returning, they would be punished, but it was another way of expressing some semblance of independence and freedom. And then there were those who truly did run away to seek their freedom in the north. And we're going to be talking more about this in future lectures as we get to that antebellum um, period right before the Civil War. But I do want to mention Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad because that is something that is developing during this period. And more and more slaves began to see the north as a, a beacon of freedom and somewhere that they might go uh, once they ran away. Remember in in earlier lectures, I mentioned it was harder to run away to freedom because there was slavery all across the country. But now the North is free and the South maintains slavery, so they could run away. Now, Harriet Tubman, pictured here, was, of course, the most famous so-called conductor on the Underground Railroad, this series of kind of stops along the way, helping slaves uh, achieve their freedom. And she helped as many as 300 slaves uh, in their quest for freedom during that era. But running away was also extremely hazardous. You might, of course, be caught in the process of running away, which could result in extremely harsh punishments. And then even if you reached the North, the fugitive slave laws of that day were very repressive, and runaway slaves were required to be returned to their masters. So even if you reached the North, you might not uh, stay there for very long. So, while it's hard to estimate the number of runaway slaves, we don't think that there were huge numbers. In 1850, for instance, one scholar estimates about a thousand slaves, and this is out of three million, attempted to run away, and many of those were caught or returned to their owners. And then there was rebellion, which I described in an earlier lecture as the most feared form of slave resistance. And rebellions did continue from time to time as we move into the antebellum era. The most famous of these was the rebellion of Nat Turner. Turner was an intelligent and skilled slave in Virginia who was trusted by his master. He had had many visions and imagined himself the bearer of some important purpose in the history of his people. And so in 1831, he assembled a group of followers and they went on a murderous spree. He killed his master and his master's family. They went to neighboring plantations and killed other slave-owning families. Turner hid in the woods for more than two weeks before being caught and executed. Before the revolt was put down, they had killed some 55 whites and over a hundred slaves were killed. The slaves were not killing blindly. They passed over many homes with whites who did not own slaves. They only exacted their revenge upon whites who owned slaves. So the Nat Turner Rebellion is a crucial moment at a crucial time. After that rebellion, slave laws grew even more strict and Southern paranoia about the defense of slavery grew even greater. But Nat Turner was a trusted slave, by all accounts, content and happy in his condition. And yet he killed his master as he slept. So if Nat Turner would rebel, what did that mean for the millions of other slaves who were held under slavery? 